I want to thank you all for inviting me here to speak about the work I'm doing with co-author Franz Manning, Associate Professor of Biologic Anthropology of the National Museum of History in Paris. This work consists of two chapters, one historical and one technical, for the upcoming Oxford University Press book called Body Art for Archaeologists Handbook. I would like to thank Franz for inviting me into this project. For today's presentation, we are only discussing the historical chapter and not the technical chapter. The title of today's presentation is Resurrecting Piercing Experimental Archaeology at a Global Scale. My main argument is material evidence of body piercing jewelry abounds in the archaeological record. However, the processes of piercing, healing, and enlarging these wounds for adornment remain unfamiliar to most archaeologists. This presentation will provide a brief summary of the diffusion of Western technological adaptations and innovations. Given the window of time, only a facet of the work can be covered. I've chosen to give an overview of the history of how the international professional body piercing community of today acquired our knowledge and the processes of how we continue to collectively advance what we know. It needs emphasizing there is a second chapter that discusses critical information about the implications of various techniques. There are various covariables of biology and technology addressed in, the, in that chapter that may be useful for archaeologists. Things such as haptics, handmade piercing tools, what today we call disposable, stages of wound healing, healing times, which include initial, secondary, and healings between stretches, piercing contraction, ongoing care and maintenance, uh, material considerations such as uh, uh, biocompatibility, surface finishes, uh, skin soft tissue expansion considerations such as biology of stretching and persistent versus intermittent pressure, comparison of enlarging techniques, uh, passive versus active enlargement, what we call dead stretching, multiple pieces of jewelry, tapers, uh, a process called subang, and of course applied force. We also need to acknowledge there is a glaring issue of lack of diversity and gender disparity in all of Western histories, really, and uh, certainly in piercing history and therefore in this presentation. While these issues must be addressed, they're beyond the scope of this 20-minute presentation. While we know of about a dozen pen pal correspondents from the 1960s onward uh, that were exchanging private letters that shared reports on their successes and failures with piercing and enlarging techniques, as well as personal life details, today's presentation will focus on a few selected examples from publications. The medical scribe Celsus provided an early account of body piercing. The specific needle and thread technique described pulled the prepuce over the glands and then pierced both sides of the foreskin using a suture needle with an attached thread. The needle would be separated from the thread and the thread would be tied and left in the piercing until initially healed and later replaced with a metal ring or fibule, as seen uh, on the left side of the screen. The needle and thread method was one of the most popular piercing techniques for centuries. After the Roman Empire, piercing and fibrillation was seldom practiced again until the rise of a moral panic regarding masturbation in the 1700s. Over the next two centuries, a few doctors adopted the practice of piercing and fibrillation, which continued to be recommended into the 1920s. From the 1880s, a rise in popularity of earlobe piercing coincided with the age of machine mass production. Inventors patented new designs leading the way to new techniques. Shortcomings in the devices pushed the need for still newer and more nuanced uh, anatomy-specific techniques. In this article, two punch piercing techniques are discussed. From Family Doctor in 1886, quote, Another plan adopted is the pincer system. This has the advantage of removing the entire piece so that the holes will not grow up again. It is exceedingly painful to use, judging from the agonizing shriek that always follows the closing of the handles. It is in this way, the movable piece being solid, what I call a paper hole punch style, the flesh is compressed and bruised before the piece is removed. An improvement of the above has been recently made by a London firm in making the movable piece hollow so that the particle of flesh passes up the inside, what I call the leather punch style. From a contributor to a, a publication called English Mechanic in 1889, quote, in reply to the query of L.H., I beg to inform him about the piercing the breasts as we boys perform the operation at the lycée I mentioned. 
The operation is so simple that it is not required to make any sketch. The only requisites are some fine, strong sewing silk, a long, thin needle with a long eye, a small-sized darning needle is just the thing, and a pair of gold ear wires of the largest size. The needle should perforate the center of the breast from side to side in a horizontal direction and should pass close to the skin of the body so that the ring when inserted may lie flat on the body below the breast. The mode in which we use to proceed is this. Standing in front of a mirror, make a little dot with ink on each side of the breast. End quote. Note, the marking technique is very similar to what many professional piercers use presently for nipple piercings more than 100 years later. The writer goes on to describe in depth the haptics of the deviceless piercing technique. From the inception of National Geographic, people were drawn to the presented body modifications. For some, National Geographic awoke a previously unknown desire to pierce. For many, it provided aspirational goals and inspiration for how to get there. London Life was published by the Strand Publication out of London, UK. It circulated from 1918 until 1960, reaching its height of popularity somewhere around 1928 to about 1941. During its heyday of the 1930s, the correspondence section was filled with fetish sexual desire. While much of the writing could easily be considered fictive fantasy, some of the contributors conveyed factual experience. A person identified as barbarian was a frequent contributor for about a decade on the topic of piercing. The following excerpt described the piercing stretch method is from 1933. Quote, the needle is of steel, about an inch in length, having a spearhead point on one end, and the other being round and hollowed out. The point should be sharp and wider than the shank so that the spearhead makes a cut wide enough to allow the extra thickness of the shank to pass through easily without tearing the flesh. The point of the sleeper is inserted in the hollow end and is left in the ear when the needle is pushed right through. This does away with all the trouble caused by having to be able to get the sleeper through the hole at the back and saves endless time, patience, and pain. The type of needle should be particularly popular with those enthusiasts who favor the nose ring vogue as it is often difficult to insert the stud in the septum of the nose after the necessary hole has been pierced. I used a similar instru instrument when I pierced my septum for this reason, but that was much thicker and not pointed so sharply, as I made the hole first in the ordinary manner and then forced the needle through, leaving the stud in my nose. The contributor called Shy was another experienced practitioner. In 1933, Shy provided an example of enlargement through a method of intervallic tapering. Quote, I fancied having a large, thick gold ring, and so my first task was to enlarge the hole in my septum. I tried various ways, all extremely painful to that sensitive part, and at length I started to wear a tapered wood plug through the hole each night. This I kept in all night despite the pain and discomfort and every night I tried to push the plug tighter through the hole in my septum. The process was very slow, at, uh, as each day the hole contracted again to near its normal size. After much perseverance, I am able to wear these rings, which swing quite freely in the large hole which I have now made. Both rings are a little over an eighth of an inch thick, and the smaller one is one inch in diameter, while the larger one is nearly one and a half inches in diameter. The historical importance of Ethel and William Granger cannot be overemphasized. They lived in Peterborough, UK. They spent the first 20 years of their marriage practicing body modification in private. They give credit for their ability to go public to Christian Dior's 1948 post-World War II return to high-end fashion coined the New Look. The New Look shed the austerities of World War II and embraced high heels, large jewelry, and small waists. William had been a devoted reader of London Life publication from the early 1930s. A major historical contribution that the Grangers provide is detailed and photographic evidence of the many fetishes described in the pages of London Life. They make fact of what easily could have been dismissed as fantasy. William also credits National Geographic for inspiration. Both Ethel and William were heavily pierced and wore corsets. Ethel's waist was reduced to a Guinness World Book record of 13 inches. The press from the 1950s world record brought them fame and pen pals from around the globe. In 1959, William began corresponding with a young American corset maker named Roland Loomis.
Roland Loomis ran his American corset company from 1959 until 1962. His life is well documented, so we won't give too many details in this presentation. However, that should in no way minimize his importance. He began documenting with photographs his body modification as a teenager in the mid-1940s. Like William and a handful of others, Roland was crafty and would design and build devices to aid his piercing and enlarging. Pictured top left is a binding method of enlargement that utilizes applied force to pressure the cells to expand and reproduce. The top right shows the enlargement through applied weight. The bottom right shows a handmade taper with a recessed step to allow the, for tubes of gra uh, graduating sizes to be installed into a healing piercing. Some of the tube sizes can be seen on the left. Although the center picture shows the taper in use, they are not being used to install the tubes. In this photo, Roland is demonstrating enlargement method through manipulation or playing with the piercing. Digital manipulation can both soften and stretch the pierced tissue. In 1977, Roland's uh, modern primitive persona becomes dominant. From then on, he is known to friends and the public as Fakir Mushafar. Rudy Inhalder, the gay Swiss-born tattoo and piercing enthusiast, moved to New York City. He missed the European tattoo clubs of the 1950s. With friends, he started the Tattoo Club of America, which was international from the inception. Although very short-lived, the club played a significant role in piercing history. At the time, tattooing was still struggling for social acceptability, and homosexuality, as well as piercing anything other than earlobes, was considered deviant. The Tattoo Club of America had a questionnaire for applicants. Rudy would receive all the applications and then match together folks with similar interests. From carefully veiled questions, Rudy could match together people that might be kinky, gay, or into body piercing. More than two dozen of the original membership have been identified as relevant to piercing history. Two of those members were Viking Navarro and Fakir Mushifar. They transmitted ideas and techniques on piercing to dozens of other members throughout the 1960s. Through the expanding network, Fakir met Doug Malloy, and through another Tattoo Club of America member, Tom Owen, Jim Ward also met Doug Malloy. Having made millions of dollars distributing um, elevator music called Muzak, Malloy had the freedom and the means to travel the world and build a network of body piercing enthusiasts. Malloy financed and encouraged Jim Ward to start Gauntlet, the first business dedicated to body piercing in the Western world. In 1975, with rudimentary techniques, $3,000, and a mailing list of approximately 100 names from Doug Malloy, Jim Ward started Gauntlet. Before the internet age, Jim Ward quickly became overwhelmed with requests on how to pierce and where to meet others into piercing. Out of necessity in 1977, Jim started the magazine Piercing Fans International Quarterly. Through this publication, piercing fans could write to each other and share the success of self-run piercing and enlarging experiments. With the rise of VHS home players, in 1989, the Gauntlet released their first how-to piercing video. As techniques evolved, more videos were released. In total, there were three. In response to Fakir Mushafar's training seminars, Gauntlet started their own in 1995. Hundreds of professional piercers received their early instruction from these week-long courses. Since 1959, Fakir had various self-publishing projects, beginning with corset catalogs, the Ethel Granger biography, newsletters, and eventually his own magazine called Body Play that covered all things body modification, including contortion, ritual, performance, foot binding, corseting, branding, and of course, body piercing. In 1991, Mushafar started the Fakir Intensives Piercing Seminars. After his death in 2018, the workshops converted to a non-profit and continue to present. To date, they've trained over 1,500 students. Founded in December 1994, BME quickly became the world's largest disseminator of body modification information. The site content was provided by users and Shannon Lorette. His wife, Rachel, managed the business side. They organized in-person get-togethers for site members. They reached the pinnacle in 2000s with millions of views and a firm cap of 16,000 members permitted to share their modification processes. Unfortunately, the site and online community quickly unraveled with the Lorette's 
publicly contentious divorce. That same year, in 1994, the state of California was writing body art regulations without consulting professional practitioners. An ad hoc coalition organized to fight for representation. After their success, the group of piercers realized the importance of organizing and formed the Association of Professional Piercers. With the unraveling of the gauntlet and BME, the APP took the leadership role in a rapidly growing international industry. As a registered nonprofit, they provided peer vetted information backed by scientific data whenever possible. The APP's outreach is through in person and online trainings, along with printed and digitized materials. While the APP's assistance with researchers and organizations, uh, in some cases, dates back decades, the APP has had very little partnering within the field of archaeology. With sharing mutual value of rigorous exploration, we hope that we may be a benefit in your projects of discovery and understanding. I want to thank you all again for inviting me to present today. It's truly an honor and it was enjoyable. And if any of you folks have any questions, I look forward to them in the Q&A. That'll be afterwards. Uh, also on the screen are various ways that you can contact me through uh, social media. Please do. I look forward to any sort of questions and feedback that you may have. Thank you.